presidential friend, the murder of Mary Pinchot Meyer, 1964. Mary Eno Pinchot Meyer propped up her latest painting, a round canvas with four colors shaped like the wedges of a pie. Then she put on a light blue Angora sweater and headed out for her daily walk. Her studio in Washington, D.C.'s, upscale Georgetown neighborhood was a converted garage behind the red brick house owned by her brother-in-law and sister, Ben and Tony Bradley. Please subscribe my channel. Thanks. Meyer was born into a wealthy family on October 14, 1920, in New York City. She was the daughter of lawyer Amos Pinchot and the niece of former Pennsylvania Governor Gifford Pinchot, who had been named the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service by Teddy Roosevelt. As a teenager in the 1930s, the attractive blue-eyed blonde modeled clothes and hairstyles for Vogue. She graduated from Vassar College in 1942 and became a feature writer for the United Press. She married Yale graduate Cord Meyer on April 19, 1945. The decorated former Marine had served in the Pacific until June 1944, when a Japanese grenade landed in his foxhole on Guam and exploded in front of him. He lost an eye. He was awarded the Purple Heart and Bronze Star. By the time he joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 1951, the couple had three sons. Quinton was born in January 1946, Michael arrived in 1947, and Mark followed in 1950. Mary turned to abstract painting and attended art classes at American University in Washington, D.C. The couple's friends were prominent Washington families, including then-Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jackie, who became neighbors in 1955. Tragedy struck the Myers on December 18, 1956, when nine-year-old Michael was killed by a car as he crossed the road. It was near the same spot that the family's golden retriever had been hit a few years earlier. By the time the ambulance arrived, Michael was already dead. Mary and Cord never recovered. They separated less than a year later, and she filed for divorce in 1958. Sons Quentin and Mark went to boarding school. It was a warm and sunny fall day on October 12, 1964, when Mary Pinchot Meyer set off for her daily walk along the towpath of the old Chesapeake and Ohio Canal in Georgetown. The towpath is a pedestrian and cycling route that parallels the Potomac River. She crossed a footbridge that connected Georgetown with the towpath and passed the ruins of an old lime kiln as well as the city's oldest surviving boat club. Then the path became secluded. A jogger noticed a black man wearing a light-colored jacket, a dark golf-type hat, and dark slacks walking behind Meyer. At 12.25 p.m. someone shot her in the head at close range. She instinctively brought a gloved hand up to her temple as she fell to her knees. The shooter wanted to get her out of sight of Canal Road. She struggled and fought him, clinging to a small cottonwood tree as he dragged her on her knees toward the dense woods. Her slacks tore at the knee and she bruised it. Someone help me, she screamed weakly. The second gunshot, ten seconds after the first one, sliced through her shoulder blade and severed the artery that carries blood to the heart. She died instantly two days before her 44th birthday, leaving behind sons Quentin, 18, and Mark, 14. At the same moment, mechanics Henry Wiggins and William Branch were stepping out of their tow truck on Canal Road above the path, they had been asked to repair a vehicle that was parked on the street, they heard a woman scream, and then two shots rang out. Wiggins was a Korean War veteran and former military policeman. He walked over to the wall that separated the road from a view of the canal and path below. When he looked over the stone wall at the scene below, he saw a black man about 120 feet away wearing a light tan jacket and dark cap leaning over the body. While Branch kept watch, Wiggins drove back to the Esso station where the two men worked and called police. When the officers arrived about four minutes after the shots rang out, they sealed off the exits to the towpath. The only escape available was by running west or swimming across the Potomac River. While more than a dozen police searched the area on foot, Officer Rick Silvis saw a black man poke his head out of the woods at 12.45 p.m., less than a mile from the body. Half an hour later, Officer John Warner spotted a black man 30 feet ahead of him as he was checking a cement culvert about 500 feet from the scene of the murder. The man, who was wet, 
was wearing a white t-shirt and black pants that were torn and unzipped. His right hand was bleeding. He explained that he had lost his fishing rod when he fell asleep. When he woke up, he fell in the water while trying to retrieve it and cut his hand on some rocks. He brought the police officer to his fishing spot, which was ten feet below the murder scene. Witness Wiggins saw him and said that he was the man he had seen leaning over Meyer's body. Laborer Raymond Crump, 25, denied that he had any knowledge of the murder. Police did not find a weapon or a fishing rod, but he was arrested and handcuffed. He was arraigned before a U.S. commissioner and held without bail on a charge of murder. Later that afternoon, police discovered a torn light tan jacket floating in the Potomac River near the murder. A dark plaid cap turned up the next day, and Crump's wife identified the clothing as his. The evening of the murder police found a fishing pole and fishing box in a closet at his house. Forty police officers combed the area around the scene of Meyer's murder for two days, searching for the .38 caliber Smith and Wesson gun that had killed her. The U.S. Park Police drained the canal and Navy divers searched the bottom of the Potomac River for the murder weapon, but it was never found. In the week following her murder, someone placed a white cross at the spot where she was killed. Meyer had left her studio without a purse or any piece of identification on her. The only clue to her identity was the name Meyer on the inside of one of her leather gloves. Police spent hours phoning all of the Meyers in Washington, D.C., until they learned that the victim was the sister-in-law of Newsweek's Washington Bureau Chief Ben Bradley. He identified her body the evening after her murder. Since Meyer was not carrying a purse, police discounted robbery as a motive for the killing. Pierre Salinger, press secretary to the late President John F. Kennedy, phoned the Bradleys from Paris to offer his condolences. Meyer's closest friend, artist in Truett, called from her home in Tokyo, where she and journalist husband James Truett were living. She asked the Bradleys if they had found Meyer's diary, and the Bradleys said they had not looked for it. According to Truett and friend Cicely Angleton, Meyer said that if anything ever happened to her she wanted her diary entrusted to CIA counterintelligence chief James Jesus Angleton. Bradley was not convinced that this was indeed Meyer's intention. The next morning, Ben and Tony Bradley walked a few blocks to Meyer's house on 34th Street to look for the diary. Versions of events then differ. In his memoirs Ben Bradley said that they were surprised to find James Angleton, husband of her friend Cicely Angleton, inside her house when they arrived, but Truett and Cicely Angleton said that Tony, the Angletons, and another friend of Meyer's searched together. Regardless of who was there that day, they couldn't locate the diary. They later went to her studio behind the Bradley home. Amid the paintings covering the space, Tony found the diary and some papers bundled together. It measured about 6 by 8 inches and was filled with 50 to 60 pages. She and her husband read them before passing them on to James Angleton to burn at the CIA headquarters. They did so, believing that the CIA had the facilities to safely dispose of it. They later learned, however, that Angleton had burned the loose papers but not the diary itself. He returned it to Tony years later. She burned it in the presence of Intruit as a witness. The Bradleys were stunned by what they learned when they read Meyer's diary. About ten pages described a love affair that she had been having with John F. Kennedy while he was President of the United States. He had been assassinated less than eleven months before Meyer was murdered. Just two weeks earlier, the Warren Commission into Kennedy's assassination had released its report concluding that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone when he shot the President. Upon reading the diary, it was the first time that Meyer's sister and brother-in-law learned of the affair. The Bradleys were friends of the Kennedy and had often dined alone with them at the White House. They felt betrayed by the infidelity and the deceit of learning of the affair after both parties were dead. Meyer, they learned, had visited Kennedy at the White House residence for the first time in October 1961. Jackie Kennedy was away with her children in Newport, Rhode Island, at the time. Meyer signed in at about 7.30 p.m. On 15 occasions between October 1961 and August 1963, always when Jackie was away from Washington, but the lovers may have also spent time together at homes in Georgetown. Their sexual relationship began in January 1962 and would continue for nearly two years.
Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas on November 22, 1963. In the ensuing months, Meyer had the impression that someone had been entering her house. In January, a maid found the garden doors open while Mary and her sons were sleeping upstairs. On another occasion a heavy wooden door was found ajar in the basement. It was a door that she and her sons were not able to open without help. Angleton later claimed that concern for the president's reputation is what led him to search for Meyer's diary of the affair. On what would have been Meyer's 44th birthday, 200 people gathered inside the National Cathedral's Bethlehem Chapel to pay their last respects on October 14, 1964. White lilies and chrysanthemums framed the altar. Her younger sister Tony sat beside their mother, former journalist Ruth Pickering Pinchot. Mary Pinchot Meyer was buried in Milford, Pennsylvania, near her son Michael and her father Amos. The next day, Crump's mother, Martha, hired respected Washington, D.C., criminal lawyer Dovey Roundtree. That morning, the U.S. attorney presented his case before a grand jury, and Crump was indicted for first-degree murder. Prosecutors dispensed with a preliminary hearing, opting to take the case directly to trial. The trial began in U.S. District Court on July 20, 1965, before Judge Howard Corcoran and a jury of eight women and four men. Prosecutor Alfred Hampman thought that he had a straightforward circumstantial case despite the fact that there was neither blood nor a weapon linking the defendant to the victim. He told jurors that Ray Crump was found soaking wet about 500 feet from the victim's body just 45 minutes after the shooting. He had blood on his head and hand. Hampman recounted that the accused had claimed he was fishing, yet no fishing pole was found. His jacket was found beside the water 600 feet from the body, his cap another 400 feet farther away. The pants and shoes he wore that day matched those seen by the witness. The prosecution believed that Crump ran through the woods for about a mile. First he dropped his cap and then his jacket into the river, poked his head out of the woods, and then spotted a police officer. He ran back east towards and then passed the victim's body by about 500 feet. He got wet trying to swim around an open culvert before running into Officer Warner on the trolley tracks Henry Wiggins was the prosecution's star witness. He testified that he heard Meyer's screams and then two gunshots. When he reported the shooting, Wiggins told police that the black man he saw standing over her body was wearing a light tan jacket and dark cap, stood about 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighed about 185 pounds. Crump, however, measured 5 feet 5 and a half inches and weighed just 145 pounds. On cross-examination, Roundtree focused on the discrepancy between the initial report and the small man being accused. She hammered home to jurors in her closing statement that Crump was just a little man. Crump never explained why he dropped his hat and jacket into the Potomac River, but he did give his lawyer another version of events. He told Roundtree that he had gone to the towpath with a prostitute, and Roundtree decided not to put Crump on stand. He had offered conflicting stories about why he was at the towpath, and she didn't want to give the prosecution ammunition to rip apart her case. Hantman called 27 witnesses and presented nearly 50 pieces of evidence, but none tied Crump directly to the murder. Nobody could establish what happened on the towpath before or during the crime. On July 30th, 1965, after deliberating for a total of 11 hours, jurors returned with a verdict of not guilty. Raymond Crump, you are a free man, Judge Corcoran said. Meyer's secret romance with Kennedy remained a private affair until the National Enquirer published a front-page story on February 23, 1976. The article was titled Former Vice President of Washington Post Reveals. JFK Two-Year White House Romance Jim Truitt, Anne's ex-husband, said that Mary and Jack had met 20 to 30 times in the White House during their romance. Why she was gunned down less than a year after Kennedy's assassination and by whom still remains a mystery. If you like my story, like it and subscribe it. Thanks.